Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you are enjoying getting to know a little bit more about verbal behavior with the Foxy Learning Tutorial. This lecture will review some of that information, um, perhaps give some more examples to help you really um, discriminate between the verbal operants and determine, determine the um, controlling variables for the verbal operants. And then we're going to talk a little bit about programming for verbal behavior and also about the instructions for assignment two. So feel free to um, fast forward through this lecture, listen to as, as much as you need. The expectation for the assignment for the discussion board is that you will know the material, but there are not lecture check-ins for this week. Um, as you, you know, the um, four weeks will um, be, uh, sorry, the lecture check-in points or the points for participation that lecture check-in usually has will be taken up by the completion of the Foxy Learning tutorials at the end of week 12. So let's get started. It's important to know that verbal behavior is a text um, or, or a book that was written by B.F. Skinner in 1957 and a lot of the um, information in the book that you'll hear about in the Foxy Learning Tutorials is um, Skinner's explanation to why certain type of behavior occurs or and also why it's different than other types of behavior. Um, a lot of the information in the book is conceptual. Uh, however, things have been proven experimentally and have been utilized within the domain of applied behavior analysis and professional practice more recently. For those of you who are interested in some of the things you've been learning about, I really encourage you to go read the text. It's a difficult text at times, but um, I've read it I think about 11 times at this point and there's always something different and new. And Skinner's analysis really adds to um, the science, our, our science, and the way things are interpreted with a radical behaviorist perspective um, helps, in my opinion, complete the, um, our science as a way to interpret and explain behavior. Like I said, it can be a difficult read, so just hang in there and, um, you know, the fact that I've read it 11 times is not because it's just um, that enjoyable necessarily. Like I said, it's because I get something new out of it every time. So it's a difficult read, but really worthwhile. When Skinner describes verbal behavior, he describes it in opposition to two different um, conceptualizations. One. He's looking at verbal behavior, somewhat obviously, in contrast to nonverbal behavior. And then two, a really important factor, is that verbal behavior is um, defined in opposition to traditional analyses, analysis of language. Um, so what um, we may think of how linguists or speech language pathologists at times interpret language. So for the first um, contrast. Verbal behavior is verbal behavior and not nonverbal behavior because the reinforcement for verbal behavior has to happen or is mediated through a listener or another person. Um, so when you're trying to differentiate between that verbal behavior and nonverbal behavior, it's really important to be looking at whether or not the reinforcement or what has reinforced that behavior in the past is mediated through a listener or is socially mediated. In contrast, nonverbal behavior will be automatically reinforced. Um, when talking about the difference between uh, Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior and traditional analysis of language, thinking about linguistic analysis, um, what you're really looking at is the difference between analysis of the function versus analysis of the topography. So as behaviorists are looking at verbal behavior, what we're interested in is what reinforces 
the verbal behavior? What reinforces the verbal response and makes it more or less like more likely to occur in the future? Um, and under what controlling variables will it occur? On the flip side, a lot of times what you'll see with a linguistic analysis of language is the interest in the formation of the word, sentences, phrases, and so on, rather than their effect on the environment. Um, so that's really the difference that you want to be paying attention to and how verbal behavior is different than just um, what we might talk about in terms of typical communication or language um, and where you may see a bit of difference between um, a behavioral perspective on, on such behavior but also behavioral approaches to teaching and um, changing such behavior. When we are looking at um, the, those functions of behavior, we're looking at some primary verbal operands, and this is what you've talked about in terms of your Foxy learning. Um, but the functional classes of verbal behavior, um, some of which are the man, tact, interverbal, echoic, textual behavior, and transcription. Some of these will go into more than others, and some you've gone into more um, in the Foxy learning tutorials. In addition, there are a few other verbal operands, um, and there have been further categorizations of these functional classes of verbal behavior, but we're going to concentrate on these for the most part and for your um, teaching protocols. These are the um, responses that I would recommend you would choose. Not all of them, of course, just but selecting one. So let's get started. When we're talking about verbal behavior, what's really in important and what you've learned through the Foxy Learning tutorials is that each operant is going to be defined in terms of their controlling variables. So um, under what conditions do these responses occur? The same response, meaning the same topography, can occur under multiple environmental arrangements. However, they would be different verbal operands because they're going to have different controlling variables. So as we're looking here, we have a typical three-term contingency, stimulus, response, stimulus could also be categorized as antecedent behavior consequence. Um, to note, we are going to list all antecedent arrangements, um, thinking back to week um, Week eight, I think, yeah. Week eight, where we talked about antecedents, we'll include all antecedent variables in that first stimulus block, um, just in order to kind of bring the operands together um, and, and make them easily comparable. So let's start with the mand. So when we talk about mans, we're talking about a verbal response that comes under the control of an MO. And um, it's really important to consider when we're talking about that MO control, like we talked about again in week eight, that an MO alone can evoke a behavior. Um, so when we talk about mans, the SD for man is typically an audience, typically a listener. So in the when an MO when there's an effective MO or an establishing operation, in effect, an audience may evoke a mand. Um, another thing that's important with manding is that it's the only verbal operant for which the reinforcement is specific to that MO um, and thus specific to the man, specific to the response. So a lot of people will teach mans first to those with limited verbal repertoires because um, it's the only verbal operant who the reinforcement will directly affect the speaker um, in terms of motivating operations. So when we talk about that man, the MO in the presence of audience will evoke the man, and it's because of a past history of response-specific reinforcement. And when we think about it, many, many responses actually will fall under this definition. So remember, it's not just topographies that we're looking for. Um, 
but any behavior who, who meets this definition would be considered a manned. So breaking it down, we have the MO plus the SD of an audience, which is usually the SD. Um, there are some, some other situations where that might not be the case. Um, a manned occurs and is followed by response-specific reinforcement. So let's look at um, an example. Um, so you can read the first example. And then we'll move on. Okay, so let's look at the cookie example. Um, in parentheses, I have a child, oh, the word wants, right? A child wants cookies. Um, we know that this is uh, not um, technically precise because we don't talk about um, things in terms of the future, right? So there's some type of establishing operation in effect that would establish cookies as an effective reinforcer, whether it's um, a CMOS of some sort or there is, um, has been some type of deprivation of cookies or maybe milk would establish cookies as an effective reinforcer. Um, we, we're not exactly sure, but the child wants cookies. They sign cookies and they are given cookies. Right, there's our first example. So what I want you to do is think about it and how would that break down into this contingency. So you need to fill out the MO, the audience, the MAND, and then the response-specific reinforcement. Give me a second. Okay, feel free to pause it, but then I want to move into the next example. You're going to be doing the same thing, filling out the MO, the audience, the MAND, and the response-specific reinforcement. So in this situation, there's a um, locked door. The um, child says, where's the key? And you say, on the shelf. We're going to assume with each of these examples that the, um, the reinforcement is similar to the past history of reinforcement. Um, but let's see, break down this scenario in terms of MO, audience, MAND, and response-specific reinforcement. And we'll, like I said, take a second to pause, but I'm going to move and look at the answers now. So in the first situation, um, you know, we noted it as a food deprivation, and you, um, so in the presence of cookie deprivation, say, and you, the sign of, for cookies, um, is reinforced with cookie presentation, or hopefully the sign cookies was evoked because of the past history of cookies following the sign in such states. Very clear man. The second one can be a bit trickier. So we have a situation where there is a locked, um, a locked door and you don't know where the key is, right? Um, and the audience would again be you, kind of vague there, but it's you. And the response is, where's the key? Now, what's really interesting is here, the um, consequence was the words on the shelf. So in a situation where um, you are manding for information, the information itself would reinforce the behavior. If um, in a similar situation, the key had reinforced the behavior, then um, this would still be a mand, right? But saying where's the key would be a mand that had resulted in key delivery, not information. But in the scenario that was given, it would not be the key that would reinforce the behavior. It would be the information on the shelf. Because at that point, then, you could um, engage in behavior, or the child, sorry, could engage in behavior to go get the key um, that you could not prior to the person saying on the shelf. So let's move forward to the tact. Now, the tact can be pretty interesting because um, before functional approaches to teaching language or verbal behavior were considered, the tact was really the center of um, how language was taught. So the assumption was if you could engage in tacting, you could engage in any other verbal operant. Of course, this analysis was not done 
using these words because verbal behavior wasn't considered, but that's the thought, right? So if I held up a phone and you said phone, then you could, um, you quote unquote knew what phone was, assuming then that if you wanted the phone, you could get ask the phone. Um, if you wanted the phone, you could ask for the phone. If you, um, um, uh, you know, if, if you engage in any of the other verbal offerings, you could do it too. That will move forward. So when we're talking about the tact, you're talking about a situation where that nonverbal stimulus evokes a verbal response and is followed by some type of generalized conditioned reinforcement. So um, the key here is the controlling variables, the nonverbal stimulus. It is something that is seen, something that is heard, something that is smelled, something that is touched or something that is tasted that evokes the response. Um, not any um, specific MO um, or any verbal response or verbal stimulus. So again, when we're looking at it, it's a pretty simple um, contingency and the way this is described here is a simple discrimination where um, a nonverbal stimulus itself evokes the tact and is followed by generalized conditioned reinforcement. So let's look at an example. Um, we're going to go back to that cookie, right? So um, you uh, hold up a picture of a cookie and say, what is it? The student says cookie and um, you um, give them a token. So you want to break that down here into the um, discriminative stimulus, the nonverbal stimulus, the um, tact itself, and the generalized condition reinforcer. I will also let you know that in this example, um, a conditional discrimination, like we talked about in week eight, was, would be a more appropriate contingency um, so if you would like to add in the conditional stimulus that would, um, that the three-term contingency would fall under, um, that would be good. But remembering that it would be, the, the SD, um, would be the nonverbal stimulus that would evoke the response. All right, if you haven't had enough time to break it down, please press pause. But we're going to move on to the next one, which could also be a conditional discrimination. So um, in a situation where you're jumping and say, what am I doing? The student says jumping and you say awesome. So how would that fit into the three or four term contingency? OK, if you haven't had enough time, again, press pause. All right, looking at it, um, in a, if we're thinking about it in terms of a simple discrimination, it's the cookie that evokes the word cookie because of a past history of generalized conditioned reinforcement in the presence of that cookie. Um, and then likewise, it's the actual jumping that evokes the word jumping because of the past history of generalized conditioned reinforcement in the, this situation, it's the word awesome. Now. Um, every time the student sees a picture of a cookie, they don't say cookie, and every time they see someone jumping, they don't say jumping. If they did, these would be pure, simple discriminations, simple tacts, um, pure tacts. However, in these cases, we're looking for some conditional control. So your conditional stimulus in the cookie example would be, what is it? Because they only say cookie in the presence of cookie when they're asked, what is it? And then in the Second example, the conditional stimulus would be, what am I doing? Because the jumping only evokes the word jumping in the presence of someone saying, what am I doing, or something similar. So that's how it would be a four-term contingency. Um, if you did not come up with the correct SD, though, where the cookie evoked cookie and the jumping evoked jumping, it's something that you're going to want to work on is coming up with the three-term contingency. So what exactly evokes a tact is the nonverbal stimulus. Moving on to an echoic. So um, echoics can be um, difficult, although at a lot of times they're discussed very simply. But when we talk about echoics, um, you are looking for a situation where a verbal stimulus evokes 
verbal behavior in the form of an echoic because of a past history of generalized conditioned reinforcement. Things to be aware of with the echoic, though, are that the echoic has point-to-point -point correspondence and formal similarity with the verbal stimulus that evokes it. That being said, um, that in the case of an echoic, a vocal verbal stimulus will evoke a vocal response. Um, that's the formal similarity. They are both vocal. If one of the stimuli, if the verbal stimulus was a written verbal stimulus and you engaged in a vocal response, they would not have verbal, uh, they would not have formal similarity. They would have, there would be different forms. So in the case of the echoic, the form is vocal. What point-to-point -point correspondence will refer to is that the um, beginning, middle, and end of the echoic are the same as the beginning, middle, and end of the vocal verbal stimulus. So if you say cat, the k matches the k, the a matches the a, the t matches the t. That is how we describe point-to-point -point correspondence. Um, so we will talk about this term of echoing, um, repeating, and it's, it's one of the things that um, if you don't really analyze language, echoic behavior doesn't seem to occur very often in um, the repertoire or the verbal behavior of um, adults. However, if you walk through the world and, and um, see how many times that in some way you will engage in echoic behavior, I think you'll be surprised. It's the way we learn a lot. Um, a lot of our verbal behavior may be reinforced through because of parody and um, can be echoic. Um, and also it is the way um, money, much learning, it's, it's the response that is learned um, and then generalized very frequently. Another thing to consider is echolalia. Um, it's something that, I mean, I think I hear it discussed less than I used to, um, but a lot of times when um, individuals with autism will engage in really, really strong um, echoic behavior, they're, they're said to be echolalic or have echolalia. Really, what this is, um, suggesting is that they have a strong echoic repertoire and honestly that the stimulus control might just be too strong or um, might be a bit restrictive. So um, if you think about it in terms of the stimulus control, it may be easier to deal with something like echolalia. Um, so breaking it down into the controlling variables of the echoic, you have a verbal stimulus but a vocal verbal stimulus. And that vocal verbal stimulus and the echoic will have point-to-point -point correspondence and obviously formal similarity in that they're vocal and be followed by generalized conditioned reinforcement. So looking again, we're talking about cookies. Um, so the first example where um, you say cookie, the student says cookie, and you say you got it. Break it down into the um, three-term contingency. All right, if you haven't finished it up, again, feel free to press pause, and we'll talk about um, the next one. Um, you know, years ago, SpongeBob was really, really prevalent in almost all of my work, and um, this, <laughs> this is something that, that might have happened a lot. Um, so um, when the student is watching SpongeBob Square, Pants, the pirate who, if you are unaware, is um, who sings the opening theme song, says, oh, who lives in a pineapple under the sea? The student says, under the sea, and the episode continues. This might be a little more difficult, but try to break it down into the three-term contingency. Again, vocal verbal stimulus, verbal response with point-to-point -point correspondence and formal similarity, and the generalized conditioned reinforcement. All right, so let's look at it. In the first example, the auditory stimulus of cookies would evoke cookies and be followed by generalized condition reinforcement in the form of you got it. 
um, something we, we do a lot. And then um, another one, who lives in a pineapple under the sea? Now, honestly, it's probably the under the sea is all that is needed to, um, in this example, because it's the under the sea that um, would have echoic control over the echoic of under the sea and be followed by the um, episode continued. Maybe that's what um, reinforced the behavior. Um, there could also be some type of other um, socially mediated reinforcement, which is what would make it an echoic. However, um, we're not aware of the exact history here, and, and that's kind of why I pointed it out, is um, whether or not this would be an echoic could be argued, right? Um, but we would really need to talk about the history of reinforcement. The other reason I put this example in is because a lot of times you'll have um, what some people might call a partial echoic, and, and really it's thinking about what, um, uh, what variables are controlling the response. So in this case, O who lives in a pineapple um, really probably may not have had um, much control over the response. If it's a true echoic, only the under the sea would have. Um, and however, the response on the part of the pirate was who lives in a pineapple under the sea, which is why um, this may be considered a partial echoic. But for our cases, we were more interested in the under the sea. Moving on to the intraverbal, which is really the base, what people talk about in terms of the basis of conversation. It's important to pay attention here because both the intraverbal and the echoic are evoked by verbal behavior or verbal stimulus, um, which a verbal stimulus is the result of verbal behavior. Um, so, like I said, the intraverbal is evoked by a verbal stimulus. However, here the response does not have point-to-point -point correspondence with the verbal stimulus. They do not share the same beginning, middle, and end, while the echoic shared the same beginning, middle, and end. Um, the other thing to watch out here is the formal similarity is not addressed. So the verbal stimulus and the verbal behavior could have formal similarity, meaning maybe they're both vocal or, or both signed or both written. However, they do not need to. So a um, textual stimulus could evoke vocal behavior and still be considered an introverbal. Um, just like your tact and echoic, the introverbals are reinforced um, and maintained with generalized conditioned reinforcement. So the reinforcement is not specific to the MO or the, re the response itself. One thing that's really interesting to think about is a question is typically a manned. Questions usually occur because there's an MO for um, some information or, or for something to be said. And um, the answer would be interverbal behavior because the answer would be evoked by the um, question itself. So if I say, how old are you? Um, that is demand for information. Then you're saying um, 92 um, would be an interverbal because the how old of you would evoke the 92 and there would be some um, generalized condition reinforcement. So looking at that, it's a verbal stimulus, any form without the, and the response does not have point-to-point -point correspondence, thinking about how old are you, and 92 do not have the same beginning, middle, and end, and generalized condition reinforcement would, um, can, would maintain the response or reinforce the response. Um, so let's look at example again. Here we go with cookies. Um, if you're not familiar with Sesame Street, C is for cookies, is a very popular song. So you say C is for... The student says cookie, and you said that's good enough for me, which continues the line. Um, so break that down into your verbal stimulus, verbal response without point-to-point -point correspondence, and generalized condition reinforcement. Go back to the 
All right. Now let's look at the next example. If you didn't have time to break it down, push pause. So in this example, you say, what are three animals? Your student says dog, cat, fish, and you give them a high five. Assuming that the history is similar to this, what is the verbal stimulus that evoked the verbal response without point-to-point -point correspondence and the um, generalized conditioned reinforcer? If you don't have time, go ahead and move on. All right, so in this situation, it's just the C is for that evoked the word cookie and uh, was reinforced by continuation the song that's good enough for me. Notice that C is for and cookie do not share any point-to-point um, -point correspondence. Even C is the C at the beginning, honestly, is only similar in written form. This was in vocal form, so I say C is for and you say cookie, the C and the k do not have any point-to-point -point correspondence. They're not the same. However, in this case, they are formally similar because I said something and you said something, or the student did. In the next case, the um, what are three animals evoked dog, cat, fish. There was no mention of any dog, cats, or fish present. Um, so there would be no suggestion of these, this response being attacked. So simply the what are three animals evoked dog, cat, and fish and was followed by a high five, which in this case um, we're assuming was a reinforcer. Okay, we're going to move on and we're going to quickly talk about textual and transcription. Textual behavior is a behavior that is evoked by a verbal stimulus. In this case, it is a, um, a text, is text, and the text evokes some type of um, verbal response, what we would a lot of times call reading. So simply the text evokes the response and is followed by generalized condition reinforcement. In this case, the verbal um, stimulus and the textual behavior do not have formal similarity However, they do have point-to-point -point correspondence. Um, if C-A-T is written, um, or the text C-A-T is there, and you say cat, the K matches the C, the A matches the A, and the T matches the T. So point-to-point -point correspondence is still there. However, there's no formal similarity. So here we have it with the written or, or textual um, text. Um, verbal stimulus. The verbal response has point-to-point -point correspondence but no formal similarity and generalized conditioned reinforcement at the end. So moving on to our cookie example, you write um, the word C-O-O-O, -O -O. we have cookies. C-O-O-K-I-E-S, your student says cookies and you say nice job or nice reading. So break that again down into your three-term contingency. Um, if you didn't have time, push pause because we're going to move on to the next one. Um, and this may happen a lot. Uh, I've been walking down hallways and in the presence of an exit sign, the student says exit and I'll just say yep, right? Um, and it's the text <coughs> exit um, that evokes the exit. So how would that fit into the textual um, behavior contingency operant? Go ahead and press pause because we're going to move on and see. So cookies evoked cookie because in the past it's been followed by generalized conditioned reinforcement. In this case it was nice reading and um, you can see where the point to point correspondence would be. Again in um, the exit situation the word exit evoked or the text exit evoked saying exit. Um, no formal similarity but point to point correspondence and was followed by yep which may have reinforced the behavior. Okay, taking transcription is another situation where verbal stimulus will evoke verbal behavior. However, in this case, the um, verbal stimulus will be vocal or auditory, and the um, verbal response will be um, written. So in the presence of a vocal verbal stimulus, writing occurs, um, and it has point-to-point -point correspondence with the vocal verbal stimulus or the auditory verbal stimulus. 
is followed by some type of generalized condition reinforcer. So kind of, um, in a way, opposite of textual behavior. So you'll see that it is a spoken verbal stimulus, auditory verbal stimulus, vocal verbal stimulus, anything like that, that evokes writing, typing, um, or finger spelling. Um, and it has point-to-point -point correspondence with that. Um, verbal stimulus followed by generalized condition reinforcer. So a situation where maybe you're doing a spelling test or something and you say cookies, your student types, C-O-O-K-I-E-S, and you turn on YouTube. <laughs> um, so how would that break down to your three-term contingency? All right, if you need more time, push pause because we're going to move on to the next example. It's funny that I said spelling test because here's a spelling test. Um, so during a spelling test, you say green, your student writes out G-R-E-E-N, and you um, put a sticker on the paper. Again, three-term contingency. All right, so here at the spoken word cookies, evoked typing K-O-O-K-I-E-S, it's followed by generalized condition reinforcement, and um, the spoken word green, evoked G-R-E-E-N, and it was followed by a sticker. I can understand where it could get um, frustrating doing all of these examples, and you had time with the Foxy Learning tutorial and all, but it's really, really important when you're talking about verbal behavior or an analyzing verbal behavior that you're considering the controlling variables. It's what distinguishes the verbal behavior, and since we're going to be talking about teaching verbal behavior, you need to consider the controlling variables and the controlling variables or the variables that you would like to control the response. So that's why I spent the time to do this um, and to, to go through these examples with you. Um, so now let's get talk, talking about what's the goal of teaching. So when we say we're going to teach something, what do we really mean? And I want you to take a second to think about that. If I say I'm going to teach a skill or teach a behavior, what am I saying? And what you'll, you're thinking about, a lot of times people are like, you're just teaching somebody to do something, right? You're teaching a behavior. But what you want to think about is, are you really teaching, I mean, at some times we are teaching a brand new skill, a brand new behavior to occur. But one, even if we're doing that, we're not just teaching it to occur at any time. We're looking to bring a behavior, whether it's new or something they already engage in, under the control of some desired environmental variable, right? So what we're really looking to do is establish stimulus control. I know everybody thinks we talked about stimulus control many weeks ago when we talked about antecedent not for conditioning and why is she talking about stimulus control again? It's done. But stimulus control really is the um, the the one of the principles involved in learning and the one that we're looking to establish. We're looking for stimulus control to be acquired so that responses occur when we want them to occur and not when we don't. So that's a really important thing to think about. Responses to occur when we want them to and when we don't. So let's look at something. So looking at when we're teaching someone to kick right? Kicking behavior is one of those things that I don't know about you, but I've spent a lot of time trying to decrease. But there are certain times that kicking behavior um, is, is reinforced, and we want it to occur. So for instance, when playing soccer, kicking behavior will be reinforced, and we're looking for kicking behavior to be evoked by um, maybe a ball rolling towards you, a ball um, sitting in in front of you, a ball being on the sideline. I apologize for my lack of soccer knowledge, but um, you know there are certain points where um, 
or certain stimuli, certain environmental variables that you want to evoke kicking behavior. Even within the context of a soccer game, um, you don't want, let's say, someone's shins to evoke kicking behavior, right? So what we're teaching is discrimination, ball evokes kick because of past history of reinforcement. No ball and a kick happens, reinforcement should not occur. Again, talking about discrimination. To bring it to an academic um, example, real, right? Um, I don't necessarily care that someone can say the word for, right? Um, just walking around saying four, 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 not interested. Um, you know, maybe at some point, but for the most part, you want people to say four under certain environmental scenarios. So in the presence of two plus two, saying four would be um, a desirable operant. So um, what we're looking for is two plus two to acquire stimulus control over the word four, and we know the way to do that is to reinforce saying four, the, the speaking four, in the presence of two plus two, and when two plus two is not present, and they say four, do not reinforce it. Talking about discrimination. Um, so that's what we want to be thinking about when we're talking about verbal behavior. How, and we're talking about teaching the verbal operants. Got to go back to those controlling variables. So once again, we're going to talk about the controlling variables. Because that's what you need to consider is how am I going to set up conditions so that reinforcement will occur in the presence of the response, but only when the correct environmental variables are present. So here we go. We've got, um, I've listed five of the verbal operands and five different controlling variables. Now, what I want you to think about is what is the most appropriate controlling variable for each? thinking about it, right, there are some here that could uh, potentially evoke any of the operands, but each one only connects to one operand. So take a second and um, fill out your matching, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, feel free to press pause here and finish it, but I'm going to go over the answers now. So let's start with the tact. We know that a tact is controlled by or evoked by. Eh, not the best connection, but a nonverbal stimulus, right? It's the only operant that is evoked by a nonverbal stimulus, so that one would be easy. An echoic may be a bit more difficult because two of these responses, two of the controlling variables, may technically be correct, but one is more appropriate. So I hope you picked the vocal verbal stimulus. Although also a verbal stimulus, only a vocal verbal stimulus will evoke an echoic because by definition an echoic has formal similarity with that verbal response, the verbal stimulus, and they're both vocal in that form. Textual is similar. So I hope for a textual, you chose a written verbal stimulus, text typed, something like that, because um, textual behavior is only evoked by a written verbal stimulus. Again, a verbal stimulus, um, but not the most appropriate answer. How, um, that being said, for the next one, a man, there's only one even potential correct answer, so I hope everybody chose the MO and audience or an audience in the presence of an MO, or when there's um, an establishing operation effect, technically. And lastly, excuse me, <coughs> and lastly, that pesky verbal stimulus is really most appropriate when talking about intraverbal behavior, because any form of verbal stimuli can evoke intraverbal behavior. So, these are the controlling variables that you absolutely need to consider when you're deciding to teach a verbal operant, one of the verbal operants. Another thing you need to consider is discrimination training. So once we have those controlling variables um, determined, which, de which controlling variable um, we need to get to acquire stimulus control, we need to make sure, sure we're setting up two situations, potentially three, but definitely two.
situation where you have the SD, and if the response occurs in the presence of the SD, reinforcement will occur. Also, S delta conditions, like we talked about with discrimination, you've seen this slide before, in S delta situations, if that response occurs, no reinforcement occurs. So what is learned here is discrimination, that the SD will reliably evoke the response because it only in those conditions does reinforcement occur. As we consider this, then we need to consider what the goal of our teaching program is. When we write goals, and especially when you write your goals for your curriculum guides as we get talking about assignment two, you want to consider four questions. Who, will do, what, when, and this could also be talked about in terms of under what conditions and to what extent. If you answer all four of these questions when you're writing a goal, one, you, the analysis of whether or not your goals are being met will be very clear, and two, it will be um, very easy to um, create programs that will result in this goal being met, or I mean not met, um, but this is what you need to consider. So when we're talking about the who, we're talking about the student, the client, the, um, the, the person who is looking to engage in behavior. That being said, it's really important that everything that is contained in your goal will be performed by that who. So the student will engage in that. The what. They engage in what behavior. The student will do what. This is the behavior of interest, the target behavior. Ultimately, when you're writing some type of program, you also want a definition of this behavior. So within your goal, you can just kind of tact the, the behavior, what you want to say. So who will do what, when. So we're talking about under what conditions. You need to talk about all of the antecedent stimuli that we're expecting to be um, present for the goal to be met. So this is where your controlling variables come in. So for a tact in the presence of some nonverbal stimulus, and most of the time we talked about whether it's visual or a picture or a sound or um, felt or smelled or something like that, but those are what conditions. For a man, it's going to be um, maybe when an MO, um, you need to talk about the MO and you need to talk about the audience. Um, for your interverbals and your coics, you're going to need to talk about the verbal stimuli all within your goal because we're not just interested in them saying a word, we're interested in them saying them when, under what conditions. And then to the what extent is going to be the criteria for mastery. Um, can they do it once? Do they have to do it with some type of um, performance criteria? Do they need to do it with novel stimuli for a certain number of times? So the, to what extent? Um, looking at two potential goals, in the first one we have when given, oh, excuse me, um, when given a model, the student will imitate the action for five consecutive novel actions. So the um, who is the student, um, the what will imitate, right? So imitation may be defined somewhere else as a target behavior, but um, uh, you know, we understand that the word imitate means to engage in the same behavior that is modeled, which is why it's important that we have when an action is modeled or when given a model. Um, and then the to what extent would fall under the five consecutive novel actions. So obviously here the um, person is looking for a generalized imitative repertoire that they engage in imitation behavior not specifically they can imitate clapping hands or touching your head but um, if I touch my nose and put my other arm out to the side they'll engage in that behavior um, without having been trained before. Um, there's some other information we might be looking for for this goal but technically it meets the criteria for what um, answering the who, what, when, and to what extent. Here's another goal where um, we talk it, the, it, the, uh, the writer talks about the student will correctly complete 10 single digit addition problems on a worksheet in 30 seconds for, or 30 seconds or less, for five novel worksheets. So here we have the student is the who. Um, what will they do? They'll correctly complete 
um, a single digit math problems. Um, and under what conditions when given a worksheet. And the criteria here is interesting because we're looking for some type of fluency um, where they'll do it in 30 seconds or less, again, for those novel worksheets. Um, so the, there may be some type of training involved, but the goal is to do it in novel situations under a certain time limit. That's the to what extent. Um, moving on, after you have the goals, then the question becomes how will, um, how are we going to teach these behaviors? How are you going to reach the goals? And there's a couple of different things you're going to need to consider. One are the teaching methods involved. Are you going to prompt the response um, so that you can reinforce behavior in the presence of a um, desired discriminative stimulus and um, not reinforce the response when that desired stimulus is not there? Um, other teaching methods that you may have learned about in the past are shaping, chaining, um, and other ones. But it's important to note what type of teaching method you're going to use. Also, you want to consider what's going to happen before the target behavior. This is where the controlling variables occur, right? So, um, how and when um, are the controlling variables and potentially the prompts um, or anything else that's going to happen prior to the behavior being admitted? exactly what's going to be presented. So if we're going to present a desired SD, so say um, a picture of something and a prompt, what's that going to look like? Also, if we're considering conditional discriminations and we're going to add in a what's it, what is it? Or a what color or something like that, that all needs to be considered. Everything that's going to happen before the behavior and you want to break it down into the controlling variables. Um, so for a tech, there's a lot of different things that can be considered. If it's going to be a conditional discrimination, you need to go back to week eight and think about discrimination in terms of conditional discrimination. If it's going to be really simple and be a tech, then you want to make sure not to add in things like, what is it? And maybe just hold up the picture. Then what happens after the behavior occurs? What will reinforcement look like? What um, will the reinforcer be? How quickly is that reinforcer delivered? Um, what are the parameters of the response for which reinforcement will be delivered? What's the schedule of reinforcement? All of those need to be thought about. And then error correction. What if they get it wrong? What are you going to do? Um, that needs to be considered as well. Is the error correction meant to be a punisher? Is it meant to um, represent a um, discriminated operant so reinforcement can be obtained. All of these things are things that can be considered, but we want to go back to the controlling variables and making sure we're considering that. And lastly, what um, when we're talking about teaching, you want to think about how, peop how the student will move ahead in a program. Um, what do they need to do to get closer and closer to the goal? What if learning doesn't seem to be occurring? What will happen then? How many incorrect responses do they need to engage in in order to get um, remediation? Um, and then you're thinking about generalization and maintenance potentially if there's parts of that to a program. Um, this isn't required for your curriculum guide, but how will you make sure that they um, manned um, outside of, of the teaching context? Um, how will you make sure that manning still occurs even though you're not working on it as extensively? Um, so you can see a lot of things need to be considered in a teaching program. Uh, but everything comes down to back to those controlling variables, back to when you want the response to occur. Um, also, what we need to consider is data collection analysis. How are we going to know whether a teaching program is working or not? And how are we going to maintain that? So the first question is, with your data collection, how are you going to measure behavior? Is it correct, incorrect? Is it um, the frequency of behavior? Is it the number of times a behavior occurs? Is it the um, number, is it how long a behavior occurs for? 
you know, any of your different measures of behavior. A lot of times we're either looking at frequency or frequency of correct versus incorrect, in which case you might do percent occurrence. Um, but you need to consider the measure of behavior. What's going to let you know whether or not learning is occurring? And then also when you're looking at data collection, you want to make sure that data can be collected reliably, meaning um, if two independent observers were both collecting data on the same behavior, that, that their ratings would match. And then there's validity to the measurement system, that what measure you pick is um, also um, you know, a valid measure of what you're trying to teach. Additionally, with other data collection systems, um, or you're not required to um, do this for this project, but you would be considering um, the validity of the treatment um, and looking at procedural integrity, whether all of the steps of your curriculum are being implemented with integrity. Um, and, um, and, and that would be looking at staff behavior, not um, student behavior. So then how you're going to analyze these data. How are you going to um, determine whether or not your, your teaching program is effective? So you need to consider when you're creating your data collection system, how are you going to graph these data? How will this measure re um, result in a graph that you could reliably do a visual analysis that we already talked about very early in the semester? So you see how all of the different things we've talked about are really linking together. So let's talk about assignment two. So the goal for assignment two is for you to cr um, create a program. And um, from that program, you'll um, create a curriculum guide or a program sheet. People call them all different things, um, where you're, you're creating a teaching protocol um, that will have all of the steps to teach um, a student who has a limited verbal repertoire to engage in some one of the verbal operands that you learned about. Um, in addition to this, you'll create a data collection system that can be graphed and visually analyzed in order to make evidence, data-driven decisions um, about, about goals and teaching protocols. So, um, so you want to look at a number of different resources prior to starting this. You want to make sure that you've read the instructions, you've looked at the rubric. The rubric has every single component that needs to be there for your teaching. Pro um, for, for everything, honestly. You'll see where the points are there. I really, really want you to look at the rubric. Reviewing this lecture also. Um, in addition, getting through at least the first half of the Foxy Learning tutorials will make sure that you um, have a firm understanding of the verbal operands and make sure that you're considering all of the controlling variables so that you're teaching the correct skills under the correct um, environmental context. And then lastly, there's a resources folder that will have a couple samples for you to look at. Very important that you do not copy the templates because these are just samples. They're not meant for you to just fill in the blanks. None of the resources will have um, teaching protocols for um, specific verbal operants, um, but there will be examples of teaching protocols themselves. Then um, you'll create three different items as your part of your teaching protocol. One, like I said, a curriculum guide, pro program sheet, um, they, they could be called a lot of different things. Um, two, a data sheet, and three, a visual display or a graph um, to, to show how you will analyze these data. For the curriculum guide, the purpose of a curriculum guide is what you're thinking about is you're trying to control the behavior of the person implementing the program. So you want to make sure it's easy to read, there aren't many words, that it covers all of the information that's needed to reliably um, and val validly implement the intervention um, and make sure that, it, that it's very thorough. Um, the important part, too, is looking at the efficiency, the fluency of the behavior. You want to make sure that they can do it easily. So a three-page teaching protocol may not have the same results as a one-page teaching protocol without many words. This is a really difficult skill, so you want to um, make sure to, um, to, to try to do this when you're creating your curriculum guide. So some of the things that you want to consider 
when creating the curriculum guide is what the ultimate goal is um, and how will the program lead towards that goal. You're going to need to write a goal as part of the curriculum guide, but also it's just thinking what do I want the student to do under what conditions. And then creating a um, teaching plan that will move towards that, really considering the controlling variables of the operant that you're interested in. Then you also want to think about the easiest way to display the program. It's really funny, we don't always consider this because we want to give as much information, as much detail as possible. But your goal is for them to read it and to be able to do it based on the reading. So you want to limit words, you want to um, maybe use tables, you want to um, give examples. All of those different things would be things to consider. Um, also, think about um, the, the audience. So if your um, hypothetical audience is, meaning your staff is someone who's really well versed in behavioral terminology, use the behavioral terminology. If they're not, don't. Um, and I'm leaving it up to you. That's not something you'll be graded on, but it's something that you want to be thinking about. Um, and then also, um, uh, if you are in some type of um, job or, or volunteer positions where you do such skills positions, think about the curriculum guides you've used in the past. What do you look for? What do you like? What do you don't like? Use those experiences. Again, don't use, um, use them as templates, but think about what you like, what you don't like. Okay, these are all of the things. This is con um, contained on your instruction sheet and your rubric. So this is everything that needs to be included for your curriculum guide. Some of the highlights um, are to make sure that your goal and, or, um, or objective um, has the who, what, when, or to what, um, under what conditions, and to what extent in it, like we talked about. Um, you also want to not um, uh, forget to um, you know, name the program, name the teaching method, talk about things as prompts, reinforcement, um, look at those criteria for advancement for remediation for mastery, um, and make sure that you describe any of the teaching procedures you're using. Sometimes we talk about teacher behavior and student behavior. So if a student does this, the teacher does this. If the student does this, the teacher does this. Um, all are different methods. You're not going to be graded one way or the other if you include them, but all of the things that are included on this list need to be included in your curriculum guide. Looking at the data sheet, um, what you want to make sure of is that um, the uh, behavior is operationally defined so that it's very clear what is being measured and how. Um, simple things. Um, uh, well, name and description of the measure that you're using. You need instructions. All data sheets must have instructions. Um, and remember, those instructions are on the collecting data. You also want name and date lines, um, meaning that staff either initial or take time or, or whatever, but you want to make sure that you will have dates and names so that you will be able to analyze these data in any way ne necessary. And then you also want um, a month sample data in the data sheet um, to give an example on how data would be collected. In terms of the visual display, what we're looking for is a graph, and that graph should look just like your graphs from the second module um, and would be graded using all of those same criteria. However, you also want hypothetical data in that um, in that graph you want hypothetical baseline data because you're going to run a baseline condition before you start teaching and then hypothetical intervention data um, it can look like the student is learning or the student is not learning but it needs to be really clear also those data need to look I need to be able to tell where those data came from in terms of your data sheet so make sure when you're making your data collection system that you're considering both the graph and the data sheet That is everything for this assignment. If you have questions, let me know.
um, it can be kind of difficult to put all these pieces together, which is why we're making this assignment and giving you time to do it. So one, consider the operant that you're teaching. Consider what you want to happen. How are you going to teach it? How are you going to measure the teaching effectiveness? And what are some hypothetical data? Good luck with this, and I hope you have fun with it. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, let me know. And um, I'm really looking forward to reviewing them.